Thank you so much. Um, and a big, big welcome to everyone. I see we have a good number of folks um, on the line. So we're, we're just really, really excited to uh, kick off the week. Um, this is HPB Prevention Week. And uh, we're excited to have uh, a great week of, of talks during this Us versus HPV webinar series. I'm Dr. Elizabeth Garner. Um, I'll be the moderator for today. And uh, I'm sure you already received this information, but just as a reminder, who's hosting this? This is the American Medical Women's Association and the Global Initiative Against HPV and Cervical Cancer, along with Indiana Universities. We've all um, partnered up together to recognize January um, as Cervical Cancer Awareness Month. We're hosting the webinar to really spread awareness about not only cervical cancer, of course, but the various diseases that are caused by the human papillomavirus or HPV. And as you'll learn um, from today, there's, there's quite a few diseases that are um, caused by HPV that go well beyond cervical cancer. And we're gonna talk today about all of the ways, the excellent and effective tools that we have to prevent um, cervical cancer and all the other HPV related diseases. So our goal really of the whole webinar series is to raise knowledge, to encourage and empower um, the members of the audience, and really to ask you to join us in this campaign of increasing knowledge about and awareness about HPV and about the uh, approaches towards preventing HPV disease. So there are a number of ways to access this event. There's a live stream, you can dial in, there's um, also video replay, and these webinars are all gonna be recorded and they're free, so you can actually come back and listen to various pieces of, of stuff if you wanna um, remind yourself of what you heard today. There's also um, information about the series at Us Versus HPV. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, and we have a Twitter handle, um, which is has hashtag us vs HPV for Us Versus HPV. All right, so I'd just like to say a big thank you to all of our supporters. Um, quite a number of organizations have come in to partner with us and support this effort. Okay, so today's topic is uh, the HPV vaccine and an update on um, HPV disease, uh, sort of an intro on HPV disease, and then we're gonna focus in on um, the vaccine itself, the development of the vaccine, and then what's happening today in the US around use of the vaccine. We have three speakers. Um, we're each gonna speak for about 15 minutes, and then um, you'll be able to ask questions and we'll do a live uh, Q&A. So you can, submit, you can submit your questions at any time during this webinar through the Q&A icon that you should see at the bottom of your screen. And um, as I said, we'll do our best to answer your questions live during this session. There are some handouts also that were uh, made available and those are in the chat box icon that you also should be able to see at the bottom of your screen. And you'll get a link to these um, handouts after today's webinar. All right, so we'll move right on into the talks. I'm actually the first speaker for today, and I'll be talking about um, an update on HPV-associated disease burden, and I'm gonna give you an introduction into HPV vaccines. As I said, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Garner. I'm currently the Chief Medical Officer um, at Agile Therapeutics, which is a women's health company. Um, so I'm mainly on the industry side now. I am a GYN oncologist by background. Um, I specialized in GYN cancers and spent a great deal of my time actually treating HPV-related disease, um, not just cervical cancer, but the other cancers that are caused by HPV, as well as precancerous disease that you'll hear more about today. Um, I used to work for Merck Research Labs actually on the Gardasil and the Gardasil 9 vaccines. So just a brief outline of what I'm gonna talk about today. I'm going to give you some introduction just to HPV itself, how it was discovered that HPV was related to cancer, um, recognizing that actually cervical cancer um, and a number of other cancers are actually caused by an infection. And then we'll discuss the various HPV-related cancers. And as I said, I'll give you an introduction to the vaccine, or I should say the vaccines that are available. So viruses, as you may know, uh, can come in various forms. Um, they are basically either DNA viruses or what are called RNA viruses. Um, in, in terms of HPV, it is a DNA virus, and it's transmitted mainly through skin-to-skin -skin contact, and I should say intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. So 
um, just holding hands with someone, for example, is not a way that HPV is transmitted. It really is has to be more intimate um, contact generally and most of the time through some form of sexual contact. Infection with HPV is the most common sexually transmitted infection. And I think that's a really important point because I think it often gets forgotten when people talk about, it, about sexually transmitted infections. We tend to think more of things like gonorrhea and chlamydia or herpes. And oftentimes um, HPV is sort of not on that list. And a lot of that is, is that really until it actually causes disease, there really are no symptoms of HPV, right? So people don't necessarily know that something is wrong or that they have an infection in the, simil in the way that they do, say, if they have gonorrhea, where they have a particular discharge or a symptom. Um, but infection with HPV is indeed the most common sexually transmitted infection. Amazingly enough, about one in four individuals in the United States are infected, and over their lifetimes, um, people who are sexually active, about 80% of people will get an HPV infection at some point. A really important point, though, about HPV is that as opposed to many other viruses that never go away, that don't clear, uh, for instance, herpes. If you get herpes, you basically have herpes and you will always have herpes, um, you know, for the re remainder of that individual's life. HPV infections, on the other hand, actually clear uh, and go away very, very frequently. In fact, although that number of 80% might, might sound alarming, in fact, most of those people will clear or get rid of their own HPV infections just with their own immune systems. It's that small pe percent of people who don't manage to clear the infections, whose immune systems, for whatever reason, and those reasons are not generally well known, there are some cases where it's, it's people are clearly more prone to um, not being able to clear people whose immune systems, say transplant patients, um, people with HIV whose immune systems don't work, those people we know are at higher risk. But for others, it's sometimes it's not known why they might not, why their immune system might not have cleared the infection. In those instances, persistence of HPV infection, meaning HPV infection lasting over many, many years, can ultimately lead to precancerous changes and ultimately cancer of those cells that are infected. So it took a while, uh, many, many years before it was actually recognized that cervical cancer, in fact, was, was a sexually transmitted disease. And it was really over time as people studied the epidemiology and risk factors, who was getting sex, uh, cervical cancer, that it started to be recognized that the disease was common in women who were what we called highly sexually active. Um, it was very uncommon to see cervical cancer in nuns who were not sexually active. And people started to think, maybe there's something going on here. Could this be a sexually transmitted disease, in fact? And at one time, it was thought that maybe herpes was the cause of cervical cancer. There were other uh, diseases that were, or infections, I should say, that were thought to perhaps be related. But ultimately, after a lot of amazing scientific work, it was figured out that, in fact, HPV appears to be the cause of cervical cancer. And the way that was essentially figured out was that um, essentially it was found that in the actual cancers themselves, HPV DNA could be detected. And ultimately, it was realized that close to 100% of cervical cancers do have HPV in the cancer. So after that, it was really then found that actually the mechanism, how the, the uh, HPV virus was causing disease, ultimately that sort of pathway towards what we call cellular transformation was figured out through work in the laboratory setting. So I just want to show you this uh, picture here. It's kind of a an image of kind of how the HPV infection causes what we call changes in the epithelium. The epithelium is just the skin, the line, your, your skin. We have epithelium all over our bodies. Um, we have skin everywhere. So if you think about it, actually, the vagina, the cervix, um, the vulvar, those areas are all covered by epithelium. So people often don't necessarily realize, wait a minute, so I have skin, you know, the vagina is covered with skin, the cervix is covered with skin. So it's all what we call epithelium and there are various types of epithelium. The epithelium on the cervix um, and the vulva, the vagina, and for males, the penile area, the oropharynx, the oral area, the mouth. Um, all these areas are, are um, have what we call squamous epithelium. Squamous epithelium is particularly susceptible to not only infection, but changes due to HPV. So on the leftmost aspect of this picture, you can see those cells 
um, are sort of depicted to be just normal epithelial cells, nothing wrong with them at that point. And then the little purple things are the infectious viral particles that somehow get in through perhaps a very microscopic break in the skin that one might not even know they have. Then HPV infections I was describing can set in. Um, in at times, HPV infection will just last just a long enough time to cause some changes in the skin, but not precancerous changes. And so we think of that as sort of changes that are just related basically to infection. And that is called CIN or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia. It's called CIN1. And that is not thought to be a precursor to cancer. And in fact, similar to the way that people will often clear the HPV infection, they will also often clear a CIN1 lesion, but you can see those. The doctors can see them when they, or nurses or whoever's doing an examination through something called a colposcopy, can see those changes um, through, a, through the mic a microscope. As I mentioned, there's persistence of, of uh, HPV infection though, and if, if it persists long enough, it can lead to actually integration. So where the viral DNA, that the DNA itself actually gets essentially into the DNA of the cells, by in doing something we call integration. And, the, and then it can lead to actual changes in the skin, which ultimately over many, many years can lead to actual cervical cancer. And it's believed that the same exact process happens, not just in the cervix, but in all of the other diseases that are also caused by HPV, which I'll be describing in a second. So we like to think about this um, as cer cervical cancer is kind of the tip of the iceberg in a way. For many, many years, really cervical cancer was thought to be the HPV-related cancer. And even now in this country, sadly, with all the work that's, that's done around detecting these precancerous changes that I described that can be detected, like I said, through these pap smears and colposcopies, we still get almost 11,000 cases of cervical cancer each year in the US. Um, cervical cancer is still the only type of cancer which, for which there is a recommended screening test, the pap smear or HPV testing. Um, and these cervical precancers, though, even though they're not cancerous, we can often treat them if they're discovered through pap testing and, um, and colposcopy. They can be treated and, and prevent um, these, uh, the actual cervical cancer from developing. Um, so you can see there's the, that number over on the right bottom part of your slide, 300,000 of these um, precancerous changes that are detected every year. Um, and very few actually ultimately end up as cancers. And, and generally speaking, the people who get cervical cancer, and in the United States at least, are people who have not been screened by pap smears. I've been mentioning all along that HPV causes a number of other diseases. Um, it's what we call a very potent, powerful carcinogen, a carcinogen meaning something that causes cancer. And, and because of that, it's a significant cause of mortality. And as you can see in this diagram, there's Right in the middle there, cervical cancer, which I've been talking about, but we also see HPV-related vulvar and vaginal cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, and then of course, um, what we call CIN1, the low-grade dysplasia. And of course, I've not talked about really at all genital warts today, but of course, cervix, uh, HPV is caused, uh, causes genital warts as well. And then higher up on the slide, you see oropharyngeal cancer um, or tonsillar cancer, and this is one of the cancers that is emerging has been emerging over the last several years, um, almost as an epidemic um, of HPV-related disease that's becoming much more um, prevalent in the United States. So now you see um, where I've put together, uh, actually I have not put together, Melinda put these together at CDC, our other, one of our other speakers. Um, this is, these are cancers um, related to HPV, the numbers for other cancers. I just talked about, to you about the 11,000 cervix cancer cases, but as you can see here, there's, here there's penile cancer, 800 cases a year, vulvar and vaginal cancers as well, anal cancers, are almost 6,000, and then oropharyngeal, as I said, is a, that's the number that's really been going up over the last several years, almost 13,000 cases. We don't, unfortunately, have screening tests for these various cancers, so they're often not detected until they actually cause a real problem, as opposed to cervical cancer, where most of the time, um, cervical cancer, if a person is getting their pap smears and, their, um, and or their HPV testing, um, they will be detected before they become cancerous. However, we do now, of course, have HPV vaccines, which have been around now for the last, for over a decade now. And because these cancers are 90 plus percent caused by a certain types of HPV, which I'll talk about in a second, over 90% of HPV cancers can be prevented 
through HPV vaccination. So that's incredible. I mean, is there any other cancer um, that anyone can think of that, that has something that's so powerful uh, that 90% of those cancers can be um, prevented through a vaccine? Um, truly, truly groundbreaking. Um, and what you'll hear about uh, later today is, uh, or on, on this talk is, is you know, sort of how, how through this webinar, we're hoping to really raise awareness about vaccination and get the rates of vaccination up. Um, just very, very briefly here, and my time is almost up. Um, I, I talked about the fact that HPV is the most sexually, common sexually transmitted infection. One thing that's very important to understand is there's over a hundred types of HPV that are out there. Um, all based on their specific um, DNA uh, profile. About 30 to 40 of those types can cause uh, uh, or are in, tend to infect the anal genital areas. And then about 50 to 20 of them are cancer causing. Um, and about 87% of cervical cancer, so close to 90% of cervical cancer are caused by types 16 and 18. Um, and then 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. But the vast vast majority of all HPV cancers are caused by types 16 and 18. And that is the reason that the HPV vaccines were um, developed against those two types. And then types 6 and 11 um, are responsible for the vast, vast majority of genital warts. As you can see here um, on the next slide, cervical cancer cases, if you look around the world, um, the green bar there is types of, of, of cervical cancers um, that are caused by type 16. The orange is type 18, so you can see that the vast majority of cervical cancers are caused by those two types, and then the remainder by the, the other types uh, that I mentioned, 45, et cetera. Similarly, um, this shows kind of the distribution of just HPV prevalence, and essentially, the main message of this slide is really, again, way over on the right, you can see the circle, 16 and 18, again, by far the majority of infections around the world, and therefore the majority of cancers also caused by those types. As I've said, 6, 11, 16, and 18 cause um, most of HPV disease, 16 and 18 being pretty much responsible for um, the vast, vast majority of all cervical cancers, vulvar, vaginal, all the cancers that I just mentioned to you. And then similarly, of course, 6 and 11. In the United States, um, Basically, the, the purpose of this table is to show you down on the left all the different types of cancers, cervix, vagina, vulva, et cetera. The number of cancers in the second column that are caused, as I said, we talked about the 11,000 cervical cancer cases. And then you can see going down the list the percentage that are caused by any HPV type. Again, the, the same message um, really being driven home that close to 90%, at least in women, of HPV-related cancers are caused um, by 16, six, 16 and 18, and then the other types that I mentioned. Um, similar slide here with, the, with in showing it in a figure form, where again, you've got the gray bars here going across along the bottom of all the different types of cancers in females over to the left here and in males. You can see the gray is 16 and 18, and then the black is the five additional types. Again, pretty much all disease caused by 16 and 18, and then additional uh, several times. There are some differences um, in the United States by race and ethnicity around the uh, distribution of disease. Um, although typically whites, blacks, um, and uh, tend to have similar rates, and then slightly less um, prevalent in other races and ethnicities. And you see a similar distribution between Hispanic and non-Hispanic individuals in the United States. All right, and then lastly, I will spend one minute here just talking about HPV uh, vaccines. Um, what's neat about HPV is that it has these virus-like particles that you can make in a lab that actually look just like the HPV virus itself, but have no DNA in, in, in them. And they, these virus-like particles are actually not infectious, which is a great thing for um, developing a vaccine because you can actually administer um, that virus-like particle and cause an immune response that is very what we call type-specific. Um, these antibodies that the human makes then after getting the vaccine can prevent HPV infection. So this is a very, very, very high level explanation of basically once people realized that there were type-specific immune responses that we have as humans to these virus-like particles, 
it was recognized that this could be a very powerful way of preventing HPV infection. And what's amazing about these antibodies is that they are actually what we call neutralizing, which means they, they really destroy the HPV virus. And are that because of that, they are highly, these vaccines are highly, highly effective. The way that the HPV vaccines in the United States were approved was basically by what we call the basis of licensure, which is basically an agreement with the FDA as to what they need to see in order to approve a vaccine. In the case of cervical cancer, it takes many, many years for, for cancers to develop. So what, it, what FDA agreed to was, well, if the vaccines could be demonstrated in clinical trials to prevent the precancers, right, those precancerous changes that I described to you, that happened before cancer, if that could be demonstrated um, through clinical trials, then the vaccines could be approved. And indeed, that is what was done for um, the Cervix uh, vaccine that was, um, and Gardasil, which were both originally approved in 2006. So the current vaccines that we have available in the United States now are, are Cervix. Gardasil now, um, once it was recognized that although the vast majority of cervical cancers are caused by 16 and 18, those five additional types um, could be put in the vaccine as well and lead to even greater protection against the various cancers and precancers. So Cervix um, is a vaccine that, that has types 16 and 18, whereas Gardasil 9 has nine types, seven of them being cancer causing and then six and 11, which prevent um, genital work. Um, Gardasil 9 has been approved for slightly uh, older people as well because of some of the continuing studies that were done. So the ages currently are 9, and, nine to 25 for cervix and 9 to 45 for Gardasil. Um, I already talked about the types of HPV that they cover. The schedules are pretty similar for how you um, administer the vaccines over three doses uh, through the inter intramuscular route. So I think the bottom line here is we have very, very effective HPV vaccines um, that can prevent well over 90% of HPV-related disease in the United States and around the world. So I'm going to um, stop here and uh, let Teresa take over. The next speaker is Teresa Rohr Kirchgraber. Um, she's at Indiana University. She's a professor of clinical medicine and pediatrics, and she's also the executive director of the IU National Center of Excellence in Women's Health. And she's going to take what I've described to you about HPV and the vaccines and talk about what we can do um, around talking to patients and families um, to address some of the uh, limitations in vaccine use that currently exist in the U.S. today. Well, thank you so much, Darren. That was fabulous. And with everything that you said, this should be a no-brainer. We should have vaccination rates reaching 100% across the country. But unfortunately, our vaccination rates are only about 50%. 50% of those that were eligible um, have actually gotten their vaccines. So we need to work a little bit harder on that. Now, what I'm going to be talking about is I'd really want to encourage everybody to think very carefully about this, not only the physicians and other non-physician providers, but family and patients and kids. So there, there is definitely a group that are not going to vaccinate at all, no matter what you say, no matter how you, you bring it up to them, no matter what kind of scientific information you give them. They're not going to vaccinate. They're never going to vaccinate. So what we really need to be focusing on those that are hesitant or not quite sure or what we call like late selective people. Um, we also have a fairly larger group, luckily, that will vaccinate without any question. It's this is what they're given. This is what they're going to do. They're not even going to um, uh, question about it. For those, we want to make sure that the, that the physicians and other providers are always bringing it up and, and being on top of things for them. But let's talk a little bit about what we call the late selective. That's the patient who, you know, when I bring up the possibility of the vaccine, they're, well, I'm not so sure about it. It seems so new. I want to wait a little bit longer. Those are the people that we need to kind of work on and mention, what is it that you're not comfortable with? Did you know that this vaccine has been going on since 2006? How much more time do you need? Um, especially kind of discussing with them that we need to get this in early in your child's development. We don't want to be waiting around. So let me talk to you about specifically what is it that you're hesitant about. Also be kind of conscientious about where they're getting their information. Now, because so many patients and, and families will go and look up things online, 
But if they're getting their information from non-reputable sources, then the information that they're going to bring and the questions that they're going to have for us are going to be, you know, perhaps a little bit different. But those that are kind of cautious acceptors, we want to really encourage them by the use of personal stories, by the use of, of examples. I frequently use my own, my own children as examples. I'm an internist and adolescent medicine physician, and, and my three children all got the vaccine. I have two boys and a girl, and I think it definitely helps when your physician or, or non-physician provider is also very enthusiastic about immunizations and brings up their, their own uh, stories and their, their own ability to do this. So, so the other is to kind of think too about where is your staff and how do they understand it? We had one um, practice in which the physician was very enthusiastic about um, the immunization practices and didn't realize that the MA who was actually giving the vaccines was not and would kind of go in afterwards and sort of talk the patients and the parents out of getting the vaccine. And he couldn't understand what was going on until he actually found that out. So it's so important that not just the, the physicians uh, agree and encourage, but also the rest of the staff and understand where why they're reluctant. Now, this study was done looking specifically at those parents who did not vaccinate their children and trying to kind of get a better understanding of where they were coming from. So in this study, we looked at um, mothers of 14 and 17 year old girls. So this was a few years ago and asked, you know, what were your reasons for not vaccinating? It was interesting that, that the, the side effects were probably the biggest thing. And most of it was because for a lot of the parents, they have never, they never have this vaccine. It wasn't available when they were going, growing up. So they were concerned that there might be some other kind of side effect. But very remarkable to me was that almost at the same level, it was because the doctor hadn't recommended it. So we need to work a little bit even harder on getting the, the physicians to be very proactive about this. Now, a little bit even worse, I guess, was when they actually did the same study looking for boys. Now, we have had recommendations for boys to get this vaccine from, from the early, very early stages. We know that, for example, boys may not have any symptoms at all, but they could very well be a carrier. Recognizing, I think, now that 40 to 50-year-old men are developing head and neck carcinomas, oral pharyngeal carcinomas, specifically related to HPV, will, I think, cause a huge impact on getting more parents to vaccinate their children. So in this study, when we looked at it for boys, the most interesting, the, the top reason why these kids weren't getting vaccinated was because the doctor hadn't recommended it. So yes, we have some work to do. Now, why? Why for physicians and other non-physician providers are they not recommending? It's not that they're not so much recommending, but if you think about this, a lot of times the, these vaccines are given in a pediatrician's office. There's the concern perhaps that the cost of the vaccine, if you're not giving it frequently, is it always gonna be reimbursed, which now we know there has not been a problem at all with reimbursement these days. Um, and, and they just didn't seem to know enough about it when, it when we first started really pushing it 100%. Especially when it came to having the guys get vaccinated. I think as the information has gone out there, it's been much more acceptable and we're getting more, the, the rates increasing, especially when we really kind of push that the vaccine is necessary and we try to do it from the patient's perspective. When we have recommendations, what we want is for the, the patient to come in and say, I want my vaccine. I don't want to get head and neck cancer. I don't want to get cervical cancer. Come on doc, give it to me. And that takes away a lot of the discussion. Multiple studies have kind of shown that when it's the kids and the parents in the room together and they're interested in doing it, they want to get it done, it's going to happen. I think as a, as a physician, initially some of our reluctance was that we didn't want to have a big old discussion about this. We, wanted, we, we kind of just would like to get it done and get it over with without having to have a big, a big talk. So we do, we need to make it routine. We need to make it an absolute. These are the vaccines that are recommended at your age group, and this is what we're going to be doing today. Do you have any questions? Let's not separate out HPV from the other vaccines. They're all incredibly important. 
the initial concerns that came out that HPV was just because of sex, I heard from a lot of parents, well, my child's not sexually active. Let's get out of that, th that thought. HPV, while it is very much related to sexual activity, it needs to be given long before sexual activity occurs. So we're not waiting for when, it, when they become sexually active. And this is by no means, by no means, an okay for you to have sex. And the studies have clearly shown that. So our recommendation is that as a physician, as a provider, we recommend, here's the vaccines that you need for this visit. We include the, the tetanus vaccine, the meningitis vaccine, HPV is just another one. So, and we also recognize that, you know, if we can get these done before you're 15, you only get two shots. That's usually a pretty good incentive for most of my patients. Two instead of three, they're, they're more than willing to do that. So our recommendation is we need as physicians and providers to be very proactive about making sure our patients get the vaccine, if, even though we may not necessarily see the complications. These vaccines are given during a, very, a kid's young age, between the ages of starting at around nine-ish or so, um, and the diseases that can occur, the cervical cancer, the oral pharyngeal cancers, et cetera, usually occur later on in life, and the pediatrician may not be the one that is seeing that. So perhaps that's part of the reason why it wasn't as, um, uh, as the numbers weren't quite so high for vaccination rates as for others. But we need to increase our rates. We need to be able to prevent this disease. We know that by every dollar that we spend on vaccines, we actually save our institutions $3. So there's no question that this is a vaccine that is usable, easy to give, um, and, and has a huge impact on society as a whole. So as a physician, I say, it's recommended that you get these three vaccines on this visit. Here they are. Any questions? Okay, let's go. And I hope that we all incorporate that into our practice on a regular basis. Even in my general medicine practice now, with the recommendation that HPV vaccine can be given for women up until the age of 46, I have absolutely been giving it in, in adults um, and have had a pretty good acceptance rate. So now I'm really going to move on. And Dr. Wharton. Uh, hello, uh, thank you. Um, there's going to be some, uh, I'm gonna be reemphasizing some of the points that were just made about communication with families about HPV vaccine as I talk about how we can do better with improving HPV vaccine. Do I have slide control? There we go. Um, so first I want to just uh, provide a little bit of information about where we are with HPV vaccine coverage, which is, is, is really not. Um, the, the, the first HPV vaccine was recommended for use in Can we go back to the slide? Uh, the first HPV vaccine was uh, licensed back in 2006, and uh, at that point there were two other vaccines that were also recommended for routine use in young people, the tetanus diphtheria and acellular pertussis vaccine, which is the red line at the top of the graph, the uh, meningococcal conjugate vaccine, which is the blue line that's lower, and then HPV vaccine for girls. Now we. We are only starting to show coverage on this graph in, in uh, 2011 when the vaccine was routinely recommended for both boys and girls. And what you can see is that coverage with at least one dose of vaccine in the orange line is much lower than it is for these other two vaccines. And given that other recommended vaccines were being given at 11 to 12, it's not that kids weren't being seen by a vaccine provider, they were, they just weren't getting all the recommended vaccines. Um, we could understand it that there might be issues with completing the series with the second and third dose that was then recommended when we see coverage with the full series with uh, at least three doses in the yellow line below. 
uh, or with um, the, the full series now, which is based on age, uh, which we call HPV up to date. Um, but there's no reason why kids shouldn't have gotten the first dose at the same time they got the Tdap and the intracarpal conjugate vaccine. So it's clear that there was a disconnect between other recommended vaccines and receipt of the HPV vaccine. And that's really the problem we're trying to address, is how to get um, immunization providers, parents, and our health systems to work together to get all of our kids protected the way they should be from these uh, preventable HPV cancers, including cervical cancer. So why is HPV vaccine coverage so low? Again, I'm going to be uh, reiterating some points that were already made. Uh, this is from a study done by Rebecca Perkins and colleagues a few years ago uh, that, that reflects our understanding of things uh, earlier on in the immunization program, but I think it's still relevant in terms of where we are now. Uh, so from the perspective of parents, uh, they feel that they weren't offered vaccination or the discussion they had with the provider led them to perceive that the vaccine was optional or not necessary at that time. And they may even report that their um, providers uh, discouraged vaccination and they don't really understand why they're being asked to vaccinate their child at 11 to 12, which seems very young to them. And even providers acknowledge that they don't necessarily recommend it strongly at age 11. They're reluctant to give multiple shots at a visit. They, they make, uh, they acknowledged uh, back in, in this survey that they sometimes make recommendations based on a risk assessment at what age they, they, they predict an individual child may become sexually active, which is not something that anybody actually knows how to do. Um, that they have limited experience with HPV, underestimate the risk. Uh, and that they see it as a difficult conversation that they've got some reluctance to have. So um, it's, it's clear there's some uh, knowledge and attitude issues that uh, have been a challenge for both parents and providers in terms of getting an HPV vaccine given at the recommended age of 11 to 12. In our National Immunization Survey, which is where the coverage data came from that I showed you a couple of minutes ago, uh, we also ask parents of unvaccinated kids uh, why the child isn't vaccinated. And uh, in, here in this slide, we show those data from our 20, 2017 survey for both boys and girls. And what we see is that there are parents who've got concerns about safety, but uh, if you look at all the other things together, there's many more parents who report that the vaccine isn't needed or necessary, it's not recommended, they don't really know about it, their child's not sexually active. And all of those things should be addressable by a strong provider recommendation. Uh, that in fact the vaccine is recommended, it's necessary, um, parents know enough to accept it and they understand that the fact that their child is not sexually active means it's a great time to give the vaccine where there'll be, there'll be the maximum protection. Uh, since the, the child wouldn't have been exposed to any of the types that the vaccine prevents. Um, when, we, when we ask providers, uh, and, and this was uh, again from a survey done a few years ago, this was by Melissa Gilkey and her colleagues uh, who, uh, who surveyed uh, providers and asked about how strongly they endorse certain vaccines given to adolescents. Um, the providers acknowledged at that time that, that their endorsement of HPV vaccine, that, that the number of them that strongly endorsed the HPV vaccine was lower than it was for the other vaccines recommended for adolescents at 11 to 12. But when, the, when those same providers were asked to estimate how parents felt about it, um, there was a, a much bigger gap between the provider's perception of parental enthusiasm about the vaccine for HPV vaccine than there were for the tetanus and diphtheria cellular pertussis vaccine and the meningococcal conjugate vaccine, the other two vaccines that are routinely recommended uh, at 11 to 12. So um, providers themselves, had, they had their own concerns, but they believe the parents had um, much larger concerns than they did. Um, and in contrast to that, when the parents themselves were asked, there actually was not that gap in perception 
Um, this is from a study done by Mary Healy and others in Houston where both parents and, and providers were interviewed about um, a number of different vaccines and, um, and the, the provider trend or the provider's estimate of the parents uh, beliefs about the vaccine shown in red shows uh, again that there was less enthusiasm. The providers thought the parents had about HPV vaccine but when the parents were, themselves were asked uh, at least in, in this survey, there was uh, strong support by uh, the parents, uh, really regardless of the type of vaccine that was being asked about. So uh, there is evidence that providers do tend to underestimate parental interest in and acceptance of HPV vaccine. Uh, so some kids finish the, or start the series but don't finish it, and why is that? Um, this is from, um, this is another paper by Rebecca Perkins uh, based on, on work that was done a few years ago about why adolescents don't finish the HPV vaccine series. And um, what, what she and her colleagues reported was from talking to parents of kids who'd started the series but not completed it, that the most common reason was that they expected the clinic to remind them. While when the providers were asked about these same kids in terms of why they hadn't finished the series, they reported that they expected the parent to schedule an appointment. Uh, so you know, that tells us a lot right there that um, there's a, a big gap in terms of where the responsibility lies Sorry, for completing the series. Sorry, I couldn't find that he So what can we do about it? Um, well, there's a number of things that healthcare providers can do to make to improve HPV vaccine coverage in their practices. And probably the single most important one is that effective recommendation for HPV vaccination as cancer prevention for every 11 or 12 year old patient that's seen. And here's what that recommendation looks like. Uh, again, um, just to re-emphasize the point that was made earlier, it's linked to the child's age. It's because the child is 11 or 12 that these vaccines are being recommended now because that's the routine age. That um, that the vaccines that are that the vaccines are due today, so there's urgency about it. It's not something to discuss and come back to later. And it's protect from serious diseases like meningitis, HPV, cancers, and pertussis that are um, that are serious conditions that are worth preventing. And HPV is no different from these other conditions. It's not something that has to be separated out and talked about in a different way. And we don't need to get into a big discussion about modes of transmission. Uh, it's not that par parents might have questions about that. They might, they might want information and certainly providers should answer parents' questions. But there's no need to uh, answer questions that haven't been asked and provide a lot of information uh, in a different way than we talk about other vaccines. Um, Providers may think they're being helpful in addressing concerns that parents have, but in fact, the parent didn't have that concern. What they hear is that there's something different about this, and different is probably not good. So um, we recommend talking about HPV vaccine exactly the same way we talk about other recommended vaccines. And then there's other things that, that practices can do. Um, use your electronic health record or your immunization information system to look at coverage in your practice and if you can do it at the provider level. In, in multi-provider practices, there probably will be some variation uh, across providers in the practice and, um, and there, there may be a way for the, the providers who are more successful at getting HPV vaccine uh, high uh, to assist in developing an office-wide strategy where other providers can be as successful as they are. And, and as was, was mentioned before, it's important to really engage the entire practice. Um, the provider may be doing everything exactly right, but there could be others in the practice who, who aren't supporting HPV vaccine as cancer prevention, and that can be undermining all the good work that the providers are doing. And then finally, implement system strategies to improve HPV vaccine coverage so that, um, you know, so that our computers are helping us, our electronic health record is helping us, our workflow in the office is helping us, that we've, we've organized so that uh, we, we really can be successful. 
And um, these are the system strategies we're talking about, things like standing orders for HPV vaccination beginning at 11 to 12, reminder recall, so that if families haven't come in yet, to so give them that reminder to come in, or to um, remind them to come in to complete the series. Um, making sure you know of other patients who are on the police list to be seen that day, uh, who's, who's, who's due for a, a dose of HPV vaccine or other recommended vaccines, and make sure that there's a prompt so that um, that, that gets that gets brought up, it gets offered, it gets recommended, and uh, hopefully it gets given. Uh, scheduling a return visit for the next dose before the patient leaves the office so you don't have that dilemma between um, I thought they would remind me and I thought they would remember. And then, of course, uh, record keeping where each dose is doc documented in the electronic health record or the, the child's paper medical record and the state's immunization information system. So, do these strategies work? Well, yes, they do. And uh, there's a a uh, really wonderful published report from Denver Health, which is a network of federally qualified health centers in the Denver area uh, that um, has a number of clinics as well as some school-based clinics. And they undertook a quality improvement project a few years ago uh, to uh, improve HPV vaccine coverage among their patients. And these are the strategies that they adopted. Um, these are very similar to the things that I've just been talking about. Uh, making making sure that you know who's due for doses, um, checking to see who, who's on the schedule, needs vaccines at that visit, standing orders, um, making the recommendation for the three recommended vaccines as a bundle, uh, monitoring provider level coverage and providing those coverage rates back to providers. And then they also did vaccination in the school-based clinic. And with those strategies, they were incredibly successful. At achieving uh, high coverage with, with one dose. Now, it's their, their complete series coverage was lower than this, but you can see with implementation of these strategies, they achieved very high coverage for both boys and girls um, for, for starting the series. And, um, and this is, is really, yeah, I think this is really very good evidence that these are effective strategies. Uh, so with those together, uh, we can achieve high coverage and we can protect young people from cancers, uh, which is you know, what we're really trying to do here. So uh, thanks for your attention. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, all right, we do have a few minutes for some questions. We've received a number of questions uh, via the Q&A uh, portal. Uh, so I will, uh, as the moderator, I'll, I'll take a couple and um, also uh, ask uh, our other speakers to uh, respond to some of them. What you're seeing just briefly before we go into the questions, this, act this, this slide actually answers one of the questions. This shows, what, and we'll leave this up here for the whole Q&A, this is a, a, shows what the other topics are that are going to be covered this week. And someone had actually, the first question they got actually was exactly that. What are the topics for the other webinars this week. So you can see the various topics happening this week. Tomorrow will be a global perspective. Um, then there'll be another talk around non-GYN diseases, a little bit deeper dive into the um, non-cervical, uh, non-vulvar and, and uh, vaginal cancers. So that, that I think will be very, very helpful. Um, Friday will then focus again on back to cervical cancer and talk about the past and the present and hopefully the future of what we'll see hopefully with uh, the talks that we heard today around increasing vaccine coverage and what we can hopefully expect to see around decreasing the rates around the world. And then uh, Monday will be an exciting discussion around um, HPV and cervical cancer champions and how to join um, in this effort. All right, so we've answered the first question. Um, there was an interesting question about whether the other HPV viruses the ones that are not included in the vaccines, whether the prevalence of those other uh, uh, other viruses has changed since um, individuals started to get uh, vaccine vaccinated with Gardasil and Cervix around the world. Um, personally, I'm not aware that there's been any large scale enough epidemiologic studies yet done to be able to show um, changes in prevalence. Typically those changes in prevalence are likely to happen over um, many years, um, but uh, if anyone, if either of the other speakers are aware of any 
studies, Australia would probably the, be the place that would be uh, able to look at this question since they've for a long time had some of the highest vaccination rates in the world. Teresa or Melinda, are you aware of any? No, I haven't heard anywhere that there's any change in the prevalence of the other oncogenic um, HPV viruses. Thanks. Melinda? Uh, same, I'm, I, as far as I know, um, yeah. the monitoring has been done so far has not indicated any change. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is, I do remember while working um, on uh, the Gardasil vaccine, there was that, that concern and that question was raised many times. So I'm sure that there are studies being done and, and uh, you know, this is a very, very important question to ask. Um, there are a couple questions that are kind of related, so I'll take those um, uh, sort of together. There was one question about whether Gardasil is as effective in preventing HPV or other diseases in the older population as compared to the younger population. And then there was also a question about um, Gardasil 9, and uh, the person asking the question had not realized that actually uh, types 6 and 11 were also in that vaccine, that it was also a genital warts vaccine, basically, and asking whether there are studies that show the efficacy for that. So for the first question around whether Gardasil is as effective in the older population, um, Gardasil 9 uh, the, is still highly, highly effective in uh, the older population, and the older population meaning uh, women age 27 to 45. Um, it is slightly less effective though, and uh, it's believed the reason for that mainly is that as, as folks get older, uh, our immune systems just aren't as strong. So our, our um, responses to getting vaccines of any type actually maybe um, are, less, uh, are less strong. So it's really mainly for that reason. Gardasil 9 is still um, approximately almost close to, it's close to 90% effective in this older population against um, cervical dysplasia. And remember the vaccines did not show prevention of cancer, right? The, the vaccines showed prevention of the precancerous changes. Um, but uh, studies looked at vulvar uh, precancerous changes, vaginal and cervical, and again showed close to 90%, I believe it was 80, 88-ish percent effectiveness in the older uh, range population. The, the actual effectiveness preventing disease in men was not shown in that age group, um, but because the diseases are so similar in terms of how the virus causes disease, effectiveness in men in that age group was, was inferred um, or sort of assumed from the efficacy data in women, and uh, that is how they approved it in, in men. Um, men were also shown to have similar immune responses um, to, the, to, the, to the vaccine. So that also supported making the vaccine available in older age men as well as women. In terms of the uh, Gardasil 9 protecting against genital warts um, disease caused by types 6 and 11, the vaccine is highly effective. And the studies that were done for uh, Gardasil initially um, showed about 99% effectiveness in females in protecting against genital warts and about 90% eff effectiveness in males. So again, highly, highly effective. And those uh, papers are published um, out there. So, and, and also can be found in the a package insert with a label, you can find those efficacy numbers. Um, all right, there is a question about Gardasil 9 and whether it's covered yet in that older population. And I do not know the answer to that. Teresa had agreed to uh, answer that question. So, yes, it is, it is generally covered. I still recommend though that patients call their insurance company because it, even if it's covered, depending on your plan, if you have a high deductible plan, you may still have to pay out of pocket for um, the cost of the vaccine up until you reach your high deductible. So you may wanna know up front how much you're gonna be paying out of pocket, even though it's technically covered. Most of the immunizations are covered without a copay. For the older, um, for the older patient, you might want to check that first. But in general, they are, they are technically a covered entity and considered part of prevention. Thank you so much. There's a question, um, there's, there's a bunch of questions, bunch of more questions that come, have come out since the end of the talk. So one more for you, Teresa. This is a great question around um, providers um, not having their schedules open six months out and making that second shot 
uh, difficult to schedule. Do you have any resources? Absolutely. A provider can be, to be the one giving the shot. Usually what we do is we set it up as a nurse visit. So you get your first shot. For those over the age of 14, you get your first shot, and then you get your second shot about a month or so later. And then your third shot, if you're over the age of 14, um, six months later. So for those follow-up shots, you don't have to see the physician or the, or the provider. It can be just done purely as a nurse visit to come in to get their follow-up shots. We like to do, especially those younger than 14, it's great to do your hepatitis A vaccine along with your HPV shot because then you do one shot now and another shot in six months and you can give them both at the same time. Um, so don't, don't try to, don't use up the, the physician's time for just doing those shots, those follow-up shots. For the initial one, yes, but for the follow-up ones, they can be done as a nurse visit. Thank you so much. Uh, another question related to sort of more generally our thoughts on involving other health-related professionals in vaccine recommendations. Is there evidence that getting the same message from multiple sources is helpful? And I'll give that one to you, Teresa and Melinda. Oh, sure. We'd like as many people as possible being getting involved. Now, the hassle is that outside of the medical community, there are not a lot of vaccines being given in other offices. So, for example, your dental professionals would not necessarily be giving the shots, but that would be an idea to, to think about and consider. We need as many people as possible talking about it and bringing it up. And so having the dental professions be involved with, with encouraging their, their patients to get the vaccines would be um, incredible. Another great way of utilizing people is with through the uh, pharmacists. I mean, the pharmacists are now giving a number of vaccines in the, uh, at the pharmacy rather than um, in the office. The key thing is to get it done. So as many people as we can possibly get involved or have access to be able to give the vaccines, the better. Uh, yeah, this is, um, just, to, just to build on that, uh, the American Dental Association has been very interested in this topic um, being uh, understandably very concerned about the increase in the oropharyngeal cancers that are now being seen um, due to HPV. And although there's a lot, there's a lot of things that have to be done to be a vaccinator, so I, I don't know that it's realistic to think about uh, dental offices actually giving vaccines. Uh, what a great recommendation to be able to make to parents. Uh, often dentists see the entire family. Yeah. Uh, they'll know how old the kids are, and they can provide that recommendation from their perspective as a, as a trusted dental health care professional that um, this is really a great opportunity for prevention and, and how concerned they are about the uh, increasing uh, incidence of the HPV-related oropharyngeal geo cancers and that now there's an opportunity to prevent them. So um, I, I do think that the engagement of uh, dentists and other dental professionals in this discussion is, is uh, potentially be a very helpful one. Thank you so much for that. And on the topic of, of oropharyngeal cancer, um, someone asked a question about advocacy. Uh, her husband was actually diagnosed with HPV-related uh, base of tongue cancer, and the side effects for, for him are really, um, you know, part of his everyday life, as she says. Um, what about advocacy on the part of patients? Well, we know we have to increase vaccine rates. We want to definitely make life better for people. As a physician, my role is to prevent disease. It's so much easier to prevent something than for, to treat it after the fact. And I would encourage the, uh, the attendee who, who brought forth that country, that, that question, use, use your husband, use your family. I mean, when, when they see a person, when they hear a story, it's much more impactful. One, yeah. of, my, one of my cousins got, had a neck carcinoma and after he learned that it was HPV related, he has been the biggest advocate for the HPV vaccine yep. among all of his friends and family. Thank you so much for that. That's very, very powerful. Um, I think I, we can take one last question live here. And I think it's a very important question. I've had to sort of select out of all the amazing questions that we have received. So I'm really sorry if we don't get to your question live here. But I do think this one is extremely important, which is um, for Teresa and Melinda, how do you talk about safety of the vaccine when you're discussing it with patients and, and their families? Well, you know, one, there's a very simple way. I like you. I like your kid. I love my children. I would <laughs> never do anything that would put them at harm. And if I'm willing to have my own children be vaccinated, I think that's probably one of the strongest 
recommendations that I have for the vaccine. Now, if you look at all the specific data and if you look at the scientific data, and I would certainly have folks go to the CDC web, website to read about it, there, there are certainly going to be no question that it's a safe and efficacious vaccine. But I, I do use my own family when I bring up the, the, how, how strongly I feel about the safety of this. Melinda? Okay. Yes, I think, I think that's a, an excellent way to address the kind of high level question or concern that comes about that. Uh, and there are detailed answers to specific vaccine safety concerns that CDC has on their HPV vaccine safety webpage. I guess the other point that I make is that sometimes the concern about safety is because of the impression that somehow this is a, a new vaccine and since it's new, there must not be that experience, that much experience with it. Well, we've had licensed HPV vaccines in the United States for more than 10 years now. Globally, you know, hundreds of millions of doses have been given, and much of this vaccine has been in countries with really excellent vaccine safety monitoring capability. So uh, our vaccine safety people here at CDC have very closely looked at the U.S. experience along with their colleagues at FDA. And, uh, you know, one thing that we did observe early on was an increased risk of fainting with vaccination. It's, it's not HPV vaccine in particular, but it's any sort of needle involving medical procedure done for kids this age. So we actually see it with all of the vaccines recommended for young adult, young preteens or young teens. And, um, and that can be really uh, pretty serious. It, you know, there can be, if, if someone faints from a standing position and hits their head, they could be very seriously injured. And so we've actually changed our vaccine administration recommendations to recommend that people stay seated for at least 15 minutes after the seated vaccine in order to provide that um, protection from, from passing out uh, from an upright position. And that's in response to um, adverse events that were reported following uh, initial recommendations for HPV vaccine years ago. So this is something that we look for. And uh, you know, when we find things, we make recommendations about uh, what to do about it. And um, there's, we have a very robust safety experience now with HPV vaccine that demonstrates that this is really a very safe and well tolerated vaccine. Thank you so, so much. And on that note, we've reached our time limit. Um, so this all brings us to the end of today's webinar. Um, thank you so, so much uh, to Melinda and to Teresa for the fabulous talks and, and in particular for the, um, really excellent answers to the questions. Thank you to the audience for your great interest. Like I said, we received a lot of really, really great questions and. Um, Apologies, we couldn't get to all of them right here on the phone, but we'll do our best to get answers to you. And uh, you can visit Us Versus HPV for details on how to get the handouts and recordings. And our colleagues will be here same time tomorrow. And the topic is going to be HPV and cervical cancer, a global success. So thank you so, so much for your participation. And we look forward to you joining us in our HPV awareness campaign. <laughs>